Shabbat Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Virtual House Church Week 3 Bible Study for 2013. Uh, we have done this before. We did it in 2012. If you want to follow along, if you go to virtualhousechurch.com, and in the left-hand menu, you'll see where it says Weekly Bible Studies. You can click on Week 3, Lech Lecha is the title for it, and um we're going to be following along with the workbook, the Genesis with portions from the Prophets of the New Testament workbook. Uh, you can see that right there at the top of the page. If you don't have one already, you can order it. Uh, and if you'd like to see a sample of it, you can just kind of click the link there. It says to view a PDF sample of this workbook, click here. And we'll just be following along with the scripture readings that uh, we have there on the right-hand menu. If you've got your workbook, you can follow along in the workbook. Otherwise, uh, you can just listen to the show and click on the links there to the right for the Torah portion, which is Genesis chapter 12 uh, through chapter 17, verse 27. In the prophets, we're going to listen to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 uh, through chapter 40, verse 16. And in the New Testament, uh, Acts 7, 1 through 8, Romans 3, 1 through 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 11, Galatians 3, 1 through through 20, uh, 29, Colossians 2, verses 8 through 23, and Hebrews 7, verse 1 through 19, and chapter 11, 1 through 12. And um, I'm going to play the audio for the uh, Torah portion in 60 seconds. There's a ministry out there that uh, condenses the whole study into 60 seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and play that now. And uh, that'll get us ready to jump right in. Shalom and welcome to Parsha in 60 seconds today. Portion is from Genesis 12, 1, 17, 27. It's called Lech Lecha, which means go. God tells Abram to leave home for a land that God would show him. So Abram, Sarai, and his nephew Lot hit the road. Due to a famine, Abram went down to Egypt. Because Sarai was dropped dead gorgeous, Abram was afraid that Pharaoh would kill him and take her. So he said she was his sister, half true. Pharaoh took Sarai as his wife, and God afflicted Pharaoh with mighty plagues. As a result, Pharaoh sent them away. Abram and Lot decided to split the land, and Lot chose the side with the greener grass. Lot was kidnapped. Abram rescued Lot Rambo-style. Abram met Melchizedek, the priest king, and was blessed. The word of God appeared to Abram, made him count the stars, and promised him that many offspring. Ten years later, still no children. So Abram slept with Hagar, the maid, and Ishmael was born. God appeared to Abram and changed his name to Abraham. God commanded all males under covenant be circumcised. God renamed Sarai to Sarah, telling him that Sarah would bear Abraham a son. Abraham was to name him Isaac. God blessed Ishmael as well and promised to make him exceedingly numerous. But God would maintain the covenant with Isaac. The same day, Abraham circumcised himself, Ishmael, and every male in the household, as God had directed. And that is Lech Lecha in 60 seconds. Yeah, boy, there's a lot of stuff to cover there, and I, we're not even going to get to half of it. Um, I, I'm I'm real excited about Genesis chapter 14, the Genesis 14 war. Uh, some of you out there may have seen the movie 300 with Gerard Butler. Um, boy, I tell you what, uh, everybody thinks of Abraham as this old guy with a long beard, you know, Father Abraham, and and that's true. You know, certainly he was. He was certainly up there in age by the time he finally uh, had Isaac, but uh, we've got to look at his younger days a little bit differently. <laughs> uh, but the original 300, actually was 318, uh, was pretty impressive. We're, we're I'm probably not going to get a chance to really talk about that tonight because um, there's stuff in the New Testament portions that I really want to talk about. We didn't get a chance to hardly ever get to the New Testament last year. So in an effort to kind of uh, spice things up a little bit and change things up a little bit, uh, I think tonight I'll probably focus more on the New Testament portions. And if you want to listen to last year's broadcast, you can just scroll on down to the bottom, toward, toward the bottom of the page where you'll see 2012 broadcast. You can click on that link or click click the play button on the player there and listen to our notes from last year. There's a couple of graphics and stuff that we talked about last year. And, of course, uh, to learn more about the Genesis 14 war, you can uh, check out my book, Archon Invasion, The Rise, Fall, and Return of the Nephilim, which, by the way, I just found out uh, was in the – has made it to the top 100, uh, actually number 85, I think, last time I checked, in the ancient history category of Amazon.com. So I was pretty excited about that. They've actually got it for sale up there. Uh, I think it's a couple, of dollars, a couple of dollars off or so on Amazon, so if you wanted to check that out. Uh, so I certainly talked a lot about the Genesis 14 war in that book as well as in the DVD that goes with it uh, and you can click on those if you're interested in checking those out so uh, let's go ahead and get started I think what I'm going to do is just play all the audio for 
the Torah portion, the prophets, which is the book of Isaiah, and all the New Testament stuff. And then we'll just get right into some things uh, regarding the New Testament. And, uh, boy, there's quite a bit of audio going on tonight. So uh, hopefully we'll have plenty of time for conversation. Uh, I want to have a conversation with you about all this stuff. I welcome you to call me at 619-789-6815, and uh, we can discuss this stuff together. Now, uh, if you've got the workbook, great. Go ahead and turn to week number three. Uh, if you don't have a workbook, go ahead and get yourself a pad and a pen and listen closely to the scriptures. Take notes. Take take just things that pop out and things that get you excited and things that you might want to talk about. Take notes. Uh, at the end of each week, there's three basic questions. How does this week's Torah portion relate to the half Torah and Brit Hadashah portions? Uh, the half Torah is the prophets and the Brit Hadashah is the New Testament. So be thinking about how does this portion that we're going to be looking at in Genesis, how does it relate to uh, the book of Isaiah as well as the um, readings from the New Testament? And the second question is, what did you find most interesting about this week's reading? So be thinking about what was it that got you excited? And the third question is, what is the general theme of this reading, and how does it apply to our lives today? Okay, so be thinking about those three questions and, and uh, you know, make, write your answers out for that. Uh, if you're interested in other commentary, uh, right underneath the uh, this week's study in 60 seconds, there's uh, commentary from an individual named Ardell that we read quite a bit of toward the later uh, portions of last year's study. Ardell's got some really good insights, uh, and you can click on the links there for his insights on 2008 and 2009. Other resources you might want to check out, BibleGateway.com. I use that quite frequently, as well as Bible.cc and Bible.is. Uh, those are all really good resources right there. And, of course, the Aramaic English New Testament Bible is just loaded. I mean, this thing is loaded with uh, footnotes and stuff for you to consider. All right, so the Torah, it's the Constitution of the Kingdom. Uh, Chuck Missler talks about uh, how there's codes in it and all kinds of neat stuff there, and we see it that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, these things happened to them to serve as, a, as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So there's stuff for us to learn because, uh, I don't know about you, but I think we're if we're not in it, we're rapidly approaching the end of the age. So this stuff is there for our benefit and as examples for us, right? So let's get started. Let's, uh, we'll begin with Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land, unto the place of Sikkim, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. 
The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou, She is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now, therefore, behold thy wife, take her. And go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and his wife, and all that he had. Chapter 13 And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, and silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or, if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Chapter 14 And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Ketileomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Vera, king of Sodom, and with Virsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Ketileomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Ketileomer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth Carnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in Sheba Kariathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwell in Hazazon Tamer. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same is Zoar. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim, with Kedileomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their victuals, and went their way. 
And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped, and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedorlaomer, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. Chapter 15 After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, and the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Chapter 16 Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. 
And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Beer Lahiroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son. And Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Chapter 17 and when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep, between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man-child in your generations, he that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. 
kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. And all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. All right, and that completes the Torah portion. Man, there's just so much to talk about there. That Genesis 14 war on Tanya is, is it's epic. I'll put it that way, it's, it's epic. And pay close attention to this alliance that uh, Abraham actually had with Mamre, Aner, and Eshkol. They were Amorites. Of course, Amos 2.9 says the Amorites got as big as cedar trees. So uh, it appears to be telling us that Abraham was allied with post-flood Nephilim giants. And this brings up an interesting question. Can Nephilim be saved? And that's actually a pretty big controversy amongst people who study this subject. Uh, I'm not going to say I have a, an answer for it. Uh, I like what uh, Daniel Duvall said. He's another researcher. He said, wherever the spirit of man is, redemption is possible. But it is interesting that uh, whatever the case may be, these Nephilim Amorite giants were allied with Abraham. And uh, after the whole incident with Melchizedek, he says, you know, just give them their portion. So, you know, he showed his appreciation to these guys who helped him, helped him win this battle. So, you know, when, when you're reading these stories, and you really got to look in the Hebrew also because the meaning of these guys' names is pretty wild. And I talk about that at some length in my uh, Archon Invasion, The Rise, Fall, Return of the Nephilim DVD Part 1, uh, breaking down the names of each one of these. But Josephus comes right out and tells you that this is a war against giants. Actually, it says the offspring of giants. This is 450 years after the flood. Uh, and they're already talking about the uh, offspring of the giants at this point, at a time when people were like Shem, you know, and others are in the five and six hundred year age range, they would they would live pretty long. And you notice in Genesis uh, 15 when he's talking, when God's talking about the covenant that He's making with Abraham, that uh, they're not going to be able to go back into the land until after the fourth generation of the Amorites. The uh, the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. It talks about, well, the, the sin is passed down, you see later, uh, we'll, we'll get to it later in the Torah, that uh, sin is passed down to the third and fourth generation. And I'm going to suggest that it's it's not just something spiritual, that it's physical, that the, that sin, uh, the DNA, has um, is directly linked to the spiritual. There's a spiritual component to DNA. There has to be. And uh, actually, in my second DVD, I think it is either first or second on the Archon Invasion, there's a video by a person named uh, Courtney Griffin or Griffith or something like that. Uh, she's doing a TED Talk and talking about epigenetics and how uh, these are codes that are laid down on top of our genes that can influence our genes and basically turn switches on and off. And there's another study done that talks about when – uh, they had taken these people who had committed murder and put them all in one focus group and people who had uh, who were adulterers put them in another group, people who were convicted of 
stealing in another group. And they found that in each one of these focus groups, the people had a scar on their uh, DNA. You know, your DNA is like a ladder. And uh, I don't know if it was uh, epigenetic or if it was in the genes or however it was, but basically there was a scar in the same place for everybody that had committed murder. And in the focus group of the adulterers, everybody had in a different place, but everybody in that focus group had the same scar in a different place uh, on their genome. And same thing with people who were thieves. And so it, it, that's how it gets passed down to the third and fourth generation. It gets passed down genetically. And all through the Torah, we see this thing about the third and fourth generation uh, regarding sin and iniquity and stuff like that. And, I, and even with the plants, they weren't allowed to eat the plants when they first went into the, to the land. They had to wait. I think in the third generation, they had, it was an offering they had to make to the Lord. And then, uh, if I remember right, in the fourth generation, they were allowed to eat it. But even to the genetic manipulation of the plants, there was issue. So uh, pretty wild stuff. I mean, again, we don't have time to talk about it. I just throwing out little teasers, but there's just a ton of stuff to talk about in all this. Uh, spiritually, giants, Nephilim, uh, Isaac, and uh, Ishmael, and just a ton of stuff, but we just don't have time. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and play the uh, portion from the prophets now, and then we'll get into New Testament discussion. Isaiah chapter 40. Have you not known? Have ye not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal? Saith the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Chapter 41 Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings? He gave them as the dust to his sword, and as driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them, and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am He. The isles saw it, and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near, and came. They helped every one his neighbor, and every one said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief man thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. 
Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them, and shalt not find them, even them that contended with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing, and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new, sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and shall make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. All right, and that's the half to our portion from the prophets, uh, in this case, Isaiah. Uh, just something real quick jumped out at me on uh, chapter 40, verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. There you see it's telling you that the earth is circular, uh, that the earth is a globe right there. Uh, so uh, that goes way back. Uh, oh, Isaiah is talking about it here. Um, but we see an idiom, you know, in this case is God. God is so big, he's sitting on the circle of the earth, uh, but the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. That's another uh, another place where you see that is in Numbers 13. And they talk about the spies came in after they went into the land and they saw the Canaanites there and they said they're all of great stature and we felt like grasshoppers and looked like grasshoppers to them as well. That's telling you they were really big, very big. Uh, again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about that, so... So let's go ahead and jump into the New Testament now. And um, there's quite a bit there. It's about 21, 22 minutes worth of scriptures there. So here's the New Testament portion. Acts chapter 7. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Charon, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession, and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac, and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. The Letter to the Romans, Chapter 3 What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner, and not rather? As we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, Let us do evil, that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. 
They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Chapter 4 What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, under whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision, or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. That righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had, being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they, which are of the law, be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So
so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Chapter 5 Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Galatians chapter 3 O oh, foolish Galatians! Who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was four hundred and thirty years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. 
For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Colossians chapter 2 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if he be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why? as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using. After the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will-worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Hebrews 7 For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, 
though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. Chapter 11 Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. All right. That completes our New Testament portion and the first hour of the broadcast. Now, there's a few things in here, well, a lot of things in here, actually, that really jump out at me, but there's a couple of observations. Um, let me see here. Where do I want to go back to? Uh, but a ton of stuff in Romans, that's for sure. Um, Galatians. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, actually, I'm going to play an audio from something in a minute regarding what exactly was nailed to the cross. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, the law was nailed to the cross. Now, I'm going to say this clearly as I possibly can. We are saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ alone, period. Saved by grace through faith alone. Uh, 
but what's this issue of bewitching and the law and what what are we supposed to do with it? You know, I I want to bring you back to something that Peter said, Second Peter chapter three. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own. And later we see John. John was the last of the apostles to pen anything. He's the last one to live, the last one to write. And uh, he said in First John 5 that the love of God is to keep the commandments. And we see in First uh, John Three that sin is transgression of the law. So what's going on? I mean, is, is is Paul contradicting Jesus? Is John contradicting Paul? I mean, is our Bible full of contradictions or what? Um, something that I've come to understand, and and the and if you really want to understand Galatians, Galatians three in particular, you need to read Galatians one. Galatians one tells you that Paul was zealous for the traditions of his fathers. Traditions of his fathers, traditions of men, traditions of the Pharisees. He was zealous in enforcing what was known as the oral law, which in that society was deemed even greater than the written law. And there was a lot, it seemed like every time a rabbi showed up, they added more to it. And that was the burdensome stuff, the quote-unquote works of the law that uh, Paul was warring against. He was not warring against the perfect law of God. David calls it the perfect it's a, it's, David calls the law of God perfect. So, how do you, how do we reconcile these some of these scriptures? Well, part, first of all, it's understanding where Paul, where's, where he's coming from. Galatians one sets the stage, and it tells you when he first got converted, that he went to Arabia. What's in Arabia? Why did he go to Arabia? He said he was taught by Jesus himself. He said he was out there for three years. Well, what's in Arabia is Mount Sinai. So Paul literally went to the place where God gave the Torah to Moses and spent three years being taught by Yeshua himself. So are we to really believe that Paul spent three years being taught by the Son, everything that the Father did on the mountain, just to spend the rest of his ministry talking against what the Father did, what the Father said, what the Father wrote through Moses? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I posted a... Actually, I just incorporated it into the show notes here, and I'm going to put it in the, in the um, chat room for you. I updated the page while we are listening to the scriptures, so you can see some of the new stuff I did. I, I put the uh, portion from Joshua. I'm not going to read all that. I just put it there for your if you're interested in seeing sort of the expanded account of uh, Genesis there, so you can read um, that portion of Joshua that goes with the portion of Genesis that we read and read all about that. Um, but if you keep scrolling down... Uh, just below the little advertisement for the book and the DVD, Archon of Asia, you'll see Paul and the Hebrews 8 Conspiracy. I actually did a whole show on this uh, Wednesday night on the Revolutionary Radio Project, uh, that and two other blogs that I wrote um, dealing with how we have been lied to. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, there's there's been a lot of um, insertions in the text. Uh, I did a whole thing on the Sabbaton. Everybody thinks uh, where it says, you know, the disciples met on the first day of the week. Mm, nope, sorry. you got to read that one. In fact, I need to post that one for you as well. Uh, let me see if I can do it while, real quick while I'm talking here. Yeah, that one really freaked me out because everywhere it says first day of the week, the word day is inserted. It's not even in the text. And where it says week the, in English they translated it from the Greek word sabaton, which is not the word for a week. It's the word for Sabbath. It's used everywhere else as Sabbath. So there's, in, in my opinion, there's a, a massive conspiracy at work there to try to get people off of God's page, off of the law. And they changed it to say, to make you think it's Sunday. And when it's talking about the first of the Sabbath, it's talking about the first and a countdown about the Feast of Weeks, which leads to uh, Pentecost. There's a series of Sabbaths that lead up to Pentecost, and it was the first of the Sabbaths leading up to Pentecost. So, yeah, I mean, 
the disciples were meeting on the Sabbath, <laughs> not on Sunday. And even though they were probably still hanging out, I mean, Paul taught till midnight one day after breaking bread on a Sabbath, and we traditionally break bread after doing a Shabbat service, a, a, a Sabbath study, uh, like tomorrow. We'll be meeting in our normal house church setting, and we will uh, study the scriptures all afternoon, and then at sundown we will break bread together, and we will eat together in fellowship, and many times continue the discussion just like Paul did talking way into the night, and if you read, you read the account, it makes you a point of saying that the room was well lit. Well, the, if you had the mindset that I used to have, that, that uh, Paul was meeting on the first day of the week, it's Sunday, uh, why would they make a point of saying that the room was well lit if it was in the middle of the afternoon on Sunday, as most of us are led to believe? No, the room was well lit because it was midnight, and the dude was sitting in the window, and he was tired, and he fell asleep. I used to think he caught a sunbeam at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or something and fell out. No, it was probably more like 1 or 2 in the morning, and the dude was tired. He fell out the window and died, and Paul said, no, not my watch, and he uh, raised him from the dead. Okay, so, I mean, we've got to rethink a lot of stuff here, and um, it's not within the scope of this broadcast right now, tonight, to be able to talk about the talk of note and all the the works of the law and all this stuff that Paul's talking about. But, and I'm not going to read all this because I did a whole show on that Wednesday night. So if you really want to listen to it, just go to the archives from this past Wednesday, uh, revolutionary radio project and, uh, check that out on the Sabaton and conspiracy, other conspiracies. But I did include in, uh, this week's show notes, the Paul and the Hebrews eight conspiracies. So you might want to check that out, read, read through all that and then read down to Hebrews eight, because that's where people will go. They'll go to Hebrews eight, verse 13, uh, and say, see, that which is old has been waxing away and, you know, it's obsolete and all that. Nope. Sorry. You got more insertions there again. And, and you know what? You don't need to know Greek. Uh, some of my detractors out there saying that, you know, listening to Rob Skiba talk about Greek is like needing brain surgery and going to a mechanic. You know what? You don't need to know Greek to know that in, there's no words there. There's nothing to interpret. We don't have to get into an argument of grammar because there's no word there to begin with. And it, anyway, go back and listen to Wednesday night show. I, I dealt with that whole thing, but I put the uh, the Hebrews eight issue there for you to check out for yourself here in the show notes. Now I want to play some. Oh, there's one more thing I want to talk about. Just kind of rabbit trail real quick. Uh, verse seventeen. How many of you? Uh, verse seventeen of Galatians three. How many of you were taught? that the Jews were slaves in Israel for 400 years. I mean, the, the Jews were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. I was. I mean, everybody told me, you know, I was raised in here. I've heard like, every pastor and their dog say, yeah, the Jews were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Um, look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ in the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that which should make the promise none of, of none effect. He's saying that the promise God made in Genesis to Abraham cannot be annulled by the law that was given to Moses 430 years later. So there's your guardrail right there, your guardrail. And it's 430 years from the promise to Abraham and the law of Moses. Well, nobody's even in Egypt until, well, other than a brief sojourn, uh, until Joseph is sold into slavery. And that's 215 years after the uh, the deal with Abraham. So how could they be slaves in, in Egypt if nobody's even in Egypt for 215 years, really? No. Uh, there's there's got to be another way of looking at that. Uh, and New Living Translation of the same scripture says, this is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later. Okay, The agreement made with Abraham is in Genesis 15, could not be canceled 400 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be break, breaking his promise. So there's your guardrails, 430 years from God's promise and covenant to Abraham to the covenant given on Mount Sinai to Moses. 430 years, nobody's in Egypt until Joseph is sold into slavery. So, and I, I did a whole study on this a while back. I think I got a link on there too. You can check it out uh, in one of my other blogs. Uh, if not, I'll make a note for myself to put it there for you. Check out for yourself. But, you know, this is why it says study. 
study to show yourself approved because we're taught a lot of stuff, but, you know, does Scripture contradict itself or not? I believe Scripture does not contradict itself. So when I hear somebody say, yeah, the Jews were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, and I read Galatians 3.17, I go, dude, nobody's in Egypt till 215 years after Abraham's covenant. So how can they be slaves in Egypt for 400 years when nobody's even there? And then <laughs> it gets even worse because Joseph is sold into slavery, and then he, has a, you know, he interprets a dream for Pharaoh. And then the house of uh, Jacob comes down because uh, Joseph, you know, is second in charge of all of Egypt now, uh, hardly a slave. The house of Jacob comes down and are saved by Joseph, and his whole family is given great honor. And the Pharaoh gives Jacob and his family the land of Goshen, one of the best plots of land in Egypt. And they rule basically as regional governors for a long period of time until a Pharaoh shows up that does not remember Joseph. So... First of all, nobody's in Egypt other than brief sojourns here and there for 215 years. Then at the 215-year mark, Joseph is elevated, and then the house of Jacob comes down. Everybody's exalted, given all, you know, great land. Nobody's a slave there for a long period of time until the dude shows up that doesn't remember. So the best I can figure is that the Jews are, I don't know, like saying Jews, the Israelites, the Israelites did not become slaves in Egypt until probably – at the birth of Moses or very shortly before it, 100 years max, they were slaves for a max of 100, on the outside of maybe 120 years, but just to say round it's about 100 years. They were only slaves for 100 years. Check it out for yourself. Don't believe me. Don't believe a word I say. Go look into it yourself. But keep Galatians 3.17 in mind when you uh, look into that. Okay. Uh, what was nailed to the cross? You know, we were all told that the uh, – the law was done away with at the cross. That's what everybody teaches. And the handwriting of ordinances and stuff, we looked at in uh, some of the writings here of Paul. So uh, I'm going to play an audio from a teaching called Nailed to the Cross. The video is actually posted on the page. So if you wanted to just kind of watch the video, you could do that. But um, this is done by 119 Ministries. And, uh, you know, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I do not agree with everything those guys say. But you know what? I love those guys. I consider them friends. Uh, they don't agree with me and everything that I say either. You know, fine. You know what? I, I love their guy, those guys. I believe that they have a true heart for God. They have a passionate desire to study the scriptures. And one of the things that I really appreciate about them is th they're very humble guys. I mean, anytime I've ever talked to them and, and uh, suggested things that they may be off about, they, they'll go back and study it. You know, they may or may not agree with me, but if they, they go back and look at it and they find something that they found, figure out that they were wrong, they'll go and correct it. Um, they've done that already with some other stuff, uh, like, like in the end, end of days teaching. Uh, their motto is test everything. And that's great. You know, it's not about who's right, who's wrong. It's not about ego. It's not about, you know, exalting ourselves. It's, look, we're just guys studying the scriptures, trying to put it all together. And one of the things that I appreciate, another thing I th appreciate about those guys is they uh, would be sitting in church and listening to pastors teach things like what I just said and say, well, that, you know, that doesn't sound right. And so they basically made a point of going back to the scriptures Forgetting what everybody has taught them, and this is what I've done as well, before I even know, knew those guys, God was basically telling me, take a eraser to the whiteboard in your head, all the notes that you've been taking from all the teachers you've ever sat under, erase them. Uh, he, God gave me a revelation on the island of Patmos, believe it or not. I took a kayak from a sailing ship out to the, to the, to the uh, Isle of Patmos where Paul, I mean, where John was given the revelation. And uh, in 2005, and I went out and found a crevice of the rock that was way on the backside of the island that was not really touched by civilization, reached way down into this crevice and grabbed a rock and held it in my hand. And I just said, Lord, man, you gave John this amazing revelation on this island. I said, would you just give me a little one too? Just just a little one? And I was just kind of praying, you know, just God give me a revelation. And he did almost immediately. And it popped into my head this question. The revelation, I believe, came in the form of this question, is what happens when you make a copy of 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 a copy for 2,000 years? And I sat there and I thought about it, and I said, well, Lord, you, you end up with something that looks nothing like the original. And he says, exactly, that's what happened in my church. Get back to the original. And I said, oh, okay. 
And I came back from that trip and in the ministry that I was a part of, they saw that I was real fired up. I mean, I was like just jacked out of my mind about that trip. <laughs> I went on the whole missionary journey of Paul on a sailing ship. I went where he went, the way he went. Uh, so it was just truly incredible. So they said, well, bring us a challenge. You know, uh, we had these Tuesday morning staff meetings where uh, somebody from the ministry would preach. And uh, it was the first and only time that I <laughs> that I ended up preaching. But they uh, they said, bring us a challenge. I said, well, okay, I'm going to. I'm going to challenge you with what I've been challenged with. And I said, yeah, great, cool, do it. I said, okay. So I wrote a sermon called, Do You Believe? And I just went through a ton of scriptures. Forget what you've been taught. Do you believe what the scriptures say? You know, and I would point to scriptures like John 14, 12. Anyone, not just Peter, James, and John, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I've done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Do we believe that or not? And I'm like, you know, we can argue about the greater works all day long. I don't know what those are, but let's go back to the previous statement. We'll do the same works. Well, you know, I mean, we're supposed to be doing what Jesus did. He told the disciples of the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all the things that I commanded you to do. Well, look at when he picked the disciples, Matthew chapter 10. Look at the first commandment after he picked the 12 disciples. The first commandment is heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, you know, all that. First commandment. After he picked the 12 disciples, Matthew chapter 10, look it up. So, you know, my whole thing was in that message that I preached was all these, you know, Mark 16, 17 and 18, James chapter 5, all these scriptures that tell us that we're supposed to be doing what Jesus did. And, you know, I just kept scripture after scripture after scripture, and I, and I would ask the question, do you believe? And I would always say when I was preaching this message, I said, look, guys, if I was the only one in this room, I'd be preaching this message to because I'm preaching it to myself, just as much as I'm not pointing two fingers out at you, but that I have three fingers pointing back at me. And, you know, so if if I'm not talking to anybody, I'm talking to myself. Do I believe? You know, and that was the beginning of a journey for me in 2005 of taking the eraser to the whiteboard of my head and just going back to the scriptures. Because we've been taught a lot of stuff by probably well-meaning people. Uh, you know, but what I've found, and you'll see this, anytime you're dealing with a seminary graduate, and, and trust me, this is the truth. If you don't, just go test it and find out. You're going to see that they will often, especially on my Facebook page, quote other theologians who are quoting other theologians who are quoting other, you know, copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. You know, some of these guys are like, do you actually have an original thought of your own? <laughs> I mean, you're like the yuppie in the Harvard bar scene of uh, Goodwill Hunting, you know. I mean, really, you're just quoting other people. Go back to the scriptures. Let's read the scriptures. Oh, the, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Ah, no, sorry, doesn't work out. That's fuzzy math, you know. And so I, I was already on that path from 2005 till about a year ago when I discovered the guys at 119 Ministries. And I saw, you know what, these guys are kindred spirits. And, and after talking with them, found out that their journey to, to create the ministry that they have now uh, started around 2009. Well, coincidentally, that's about the same time that my wife and I was actually 2010 or so that uh, my wife and I discovered Torah. I mean, of course, we know it was in the Bible, but and I've read it. I've read it a few times as a kid or whatever, and even as an adult, but never studied it. Uh, but that's where we began with intent three years ago. We, in 2010, we began to study the Torah. We went through a whole year cycle. Three years, you know, that we are now starting the fourth year, that's what we're in right now, of studying the Torah. Why? Because Jesus told the guys on the road to Emmaus that he began with Moses and started through the prophets and explained everything in those scriptures, those scriptures that told about him. So I'm like, well, you know, I, I know Jesus is all over the New Testament. I've been in the New Testament my whole life. But I've never thought about Jesus being in the Old Testament, you know, other than like Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53. I mean, those are kind of cliche at this point. Uh, so going back to the Torah, starting from Genesis 1-1 and going right through it with intent of looking for Yeshua in the Torah. And after three years of doing that, because somebody's like, why would I want to do that? You know, Jesus isn't there. I'm like, are you kidding me? Jesus is everywhere. Yeshua's everywhere. He's all over the Torah. Um, so anyway, those guys, the 119 Ministries, uh, are studying the scriptures for themselves. Do they have it all right? No. Do I have it all right? No. Do you? No. None of us do. Test all things, including the audio you're about to hear from 119 Ministries called Nailed to the Cross. If you have not viewed our teaching titled The Lost Sheep, 
we encourage you to do so, as you will find these two teachings go hand in hand. Colossians chapter 2. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. These are some difficult verses for some to explain. Many, however, use these two verses as proof text in saying that Yeshua did away with the law. But is this really possible? Is this really what Yeshua nailed to the cross? Is this really what Paul is referencing in his letter to the Colossians? Paul lived in obedience to the law, according to Acts 21, verse 24. Then everybody will know that there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. And he agreed with everything in the law and the prophets as mentioned in Acts 24, verse 14. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. Knowing this, we can't let our interpretations of Paul's writings make him out to be a hypocrite, doing one thing, yet saying another. Paul was once a Pharisee, and though the Pharisees were steeped into their traditions, they studied the Word, and Paul did as well. Paul's writings were deep, very deep, so much so that they created confusion for many. In fact, he was falsely accused of preaching against Moses. Consider Acts 21, verse 21. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. An accusation that is still being spread about Paul to this day. Plus, knowing that Peter warned against those who misrepresent Paul to mean lawlessness, can we really hold to any interpretation of Paul's writings that says he opposed the law? Remember, his own words declare that he agrees with everything in the law and the prophets. With this in mind, knowing his history as a Pharisee in teaching, and that he lived according to the law, doesn't it make sense that Paul would use illustrations and examples from the law and the prophets? Could it be possible that this verse in Colossians is actually a reference to something in the Torah? Could this be one of those verses that many use to misrepresent Paul? All the while, he could actually be reinforcing his argument in favor of the law. As mentioned in our Lost Sheep teaching, Yeshua, the living word, had to die in order to remarry the lost sheep of Israel since God divorced them. Please see our teaching, The Lost Sheep, for further details on this topic. However, that was specifically so God could remarry and unite his bride, the twelve tribes, because a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. But what of the bride who was divorced? The northern kingdom. What was her penalty for adultery? Just being divorced? Or was there something more to it? Could this be what Paul is referencing here in Colossians? Something that refers to the bride who was divorced? Let's begin our study and see what we find regarding these verses in Colossians chapter 2. Consider the following regarding Yeshua on the cross. John chapter 19. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. What scripture would be fulfilled here? How many times did he say this when he only said it because the scripture said it would happen that way? Like the donkey. Did he need the donkey to go into Jerusalem? Of course not. But he did it because the scripture said it was going to happen that way. 
Things that were prophesied, which required action on his part, he had to make sure they happened. So those around would have no excuse for not seeing prophecy taking place right before their eyes. Yet other prophecies that required action on others were clearly orchestrated by the Spirit. For example, consider the verses surrounding 28 and 29 here. John 19, 24. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. And John 19, 34. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with the spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. But why here in verse 28 and 29? What scripture needed to be fulfilled that he should have a need to drink something? I believe, quite possibly, we have the answer. What was he given to drink? Wine vinegar from a sponge, in essence, that which was bitter. What's the scripture that needed to be fulfilled? Consider this account in Numbers chapter 5. Numbers chapter 5. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him by sleeping with another man, and this is hidden from her husband, and her impurity is undetected, since there was no witnesses against her, and she has not been caught in the act, and if feelings of jealousy come over her husband, and he suspects his wife, and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her even though she is not impure, then he is to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of a tenth of an ephah of barley flour on her behalf. He must not pour oil on it or put incense on it, because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to guilt. The priest shall bring her and have her stand before Yahweh. Then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. After the priest has had the woman stand before Yahweh, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands the reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, If no other man has slept with you, and you have not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband, and you have defiled yourself by sleeping with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse of oath. May Yahweh cause your people to curse and denounce you when he causes your thigh to waste away and your abdomen to swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells and your thigh waste away. Then the woman is to say, Amen, so be it. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall have the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse, and this water will enter her and cause bitter suffering. Verses 26 and 27 reiterates it again. The priest is then to take a handful of the grain offering as a memorial offering and burn it on the altar. After that, he is to have the woman drink the water. If she has defiled herself and been unfaithful to her husband, then when she is made to drink the water that brings a curse, it will go into her and cause bitter suffering. Her abdomen will swell and her thigh waste away, and she will become accursed among her people. This is what is referred to as the law of jealousy. 529. 
This then is the law of jealousy when a woman goes astray and defiles herself while married to her husband. Why is this of any significance? Consider Exodus 34. Do not worship any other God, for Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4. For Yahweh, your God, is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Remember, as shown in the lost sheep teaching, the northern kingdom was divorced because of her adultery. God considered himself a husband to Israel. Jeremiah 31. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. And Isaiah 54. For your maker is your husband. Yahweh Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. This scroll, mentioned in Numbers 5.23, contains the handwriting of ordinances. It was these ordinances in the handwriting on the scroll that was contrary to us or against us. It was these written ordinances that was washed off the scroll into the cup, then was nailed to the cross through Yeshua. He had to drink the cup as prescribed in the law for the wife accused of adultery. This is why he had to drink the bitter water. This is why he said, I thirst. This was what was needed to be fulfilled. And now we understand why Yeshua prayed in the garden. Matthew 26. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Compare again verse 14 in Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. This is the handwriting of ordinances. This was the curse as mentioned in Numbers 521 that he took away from us. So, here we see that Yeshua not only died so he could remarry his divorced bride, but he took the place of her judgment, nailing that judgment to the cross. He had to drink from the cup, the cup of bitter water that was to be given to the wife accused of adultery. He knew what the outcome of this cup would bring. Thus, he prayed for it to be taken away. Consider this verse regarding the curse in Numbers 5 that says, May Yahweh cause your people to curse and denounce you when he causes your thigh to waste away and your abdomen to swell. May Yahweh cause your people to curse and denounce you. Now, consider Matthew 27. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. They cursed and denounced him at the very timing of the curse going forth. And what time is that? Again, 521. May Yahweh cause your people to curse and denounce you when he causes your thigh to waste away and your abdomen to swell. The time of his thigh wasting away and his abdomen swelling. First, his thigh. The thigh is representative of an individual's word or credibility or even authority, used in matters of keeping one's word. This is why we see oaths were given while a man's hand was under the other's thigh. For example, Genesis 24, So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master, Abraham, and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. And Genesis 47, When the time drew near for Israel to die, he called for his son, Joseph, and said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh, and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt. Thus, the thigh wasting away would be representative of one's credibility being useless. When Yeshua did not give the proof that the crowds demanded of him for being the Son of God, his credibility meant nothing. Consider 
Matthew 27, and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross, if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. He held no credibility with them. Yet, there will be no mistaking his word, credibility, or authority at his second coming. His thigh will make it very clear. Revelation 19. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's interesting to also note that some say, according to certain definitions, the strongest muscle of the body is usually said to be the quadriceps, located in the thigh. Though on the cross his strength appeared as weakness, there will be no question to his strength at his second coming. Though a spiritual understanding of the thigh is enough to get one's attention, how did his thigh physically waste away while on the cross? It was the thighs that one used in raising themselves up in order to breathe when being crucified. After all this suffering and torture that happened before ever seeing the cross, then, after several hours of constantly lifting himself up on the cross just to struggle to breathe, his thighs finally gave way, or should I say, wasted away, leading to how many show he actually suffocated after saying, it is finished, because truly his thighs could lift him no more. There was no strength left. He suffocated as a result of his thighs wasting away. But what of his abdomen? For it says in chapter 5, May Yahweh cause your people to curse and denounce you when he causes your thigh to waste away and your abdomen to swell. We all have taken big breaths to fill our lungs with air. It's a strong breath that we take in. A strong breath is when your chest is forced out. But what about a relaxed breath? Does your chest rise out or your stomach? Your stomach, of course. The lungs can only expand so much because of the ribs. And just as the electricity travels best in the least paths of resistance, likewise, our lungs expand toward the least resistance given. In a relaxed state, that expansion is downward. Normally, our abdomen rises just as much, if not more, in relaxed breathing. But this is not what caused his abdomen to swell on the cross. Stay with me here. Let's think about it for a minute. Our Savior had been up all night in a mock trial. Plus, we know that he was stressed, as it is recorded that his sweat was mixed with blood the night of praying in the garden. Luke 22. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became as it were great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. It's not like he entered this day with a good night's sleep on a nice mattress. So he's been up over 24 hours. After being smacked around from the Pharisees and having his beard pulled, he gets beat up from the Roman soldiers, then presented to his people with a crown of thorns. Then he gets flogged to the point of hardly having human recognition, according to Isaiah. Isaiah 52, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Then he has to carry his own cross and falls under its weight, unable to go any further. To say he has any strength to breathe strong while on the cross is pushing it. His body is spent and exhausted. Every breath taken is in weakness, not strength. But he wasn't only unable to breathe strong. Most all who have studied the science behind the crucifixion of Yeshua agree that his lungs, in fact, filled with fluids, 
while he hung on the cross at the hands of the Romans. The sheer weight of the fluid filling the lungs would be enough to pull down on the lungs and push the abdomen out. Not much different from filling a water balloon. No matter how small, the more you fill it, not only does it get bigger, but it also stretches and pulls down from the weight. Plus, what little breathing he was doing, that his lungs could take in, that is, was only pushing the stomach farther down. This in turn forced our Savior's abdomen to swell out, just as in the curse, as given in Numbers chapter 5 to the unfaithful wife. Plus, verse 27 adds an element of bitter suffering. Numbers chapter 5. If she has defiled herself and been unfaithful to her husband, then when she is made to drink the water that brings a curse, it will go into her and cause bitter suffering. Her abdomen will swell and her thigh waste away, and she will become accursed among her people. I think there can be no argument that Yeshua endured bitter suffering on the cross. Thus, he took the punishment of the unfaithful spouse. Compare again verse 23 and 24. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall have the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse, and this water will enter her and cause bitter suffering. He took the curse as mentioned in verse 23 and nailed it to the cross. He took the curse of Numbers chapter 5 that applied to the unfaithful wife and nailed it to the cross through his death, just as mentioned in Colossians chapter 2, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, completely enabling his divorced wife to be wiped clean of her guilt and be remarried at the same time, she can now be justified, justified, declared or made righteous in the sight of God, justified, just if I'd never done it. Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. He takes our sin and removes it through his death. Romans chapter 6, or are ye ignorant that all we who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him through baptism unto death, that, like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that so we should no longer be in bondage to sin. For he that had died is justified from sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. He removed all barriers that prevented the northern kingdom from coming to him through his death on the cross. We must remember that the law was never a barrier that kept anyone from him. It was the sin of the northern kingdom that kept them from him. The curse that resulted in not obeying the law. Torah, his perfect instructions. The law has never stood opposed to anyone. The law itself is neutral. It blesses and it curses, totally depending on one's obedience or lack thereof. Thus, our obedience produces blessings, and our disobedience produces the curses. Yet, he removed all barriers so all can come to him in faith, so all can come into the covenant with him as before. Galatians chapter 3. 
But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But let us not forget the faith by itself is dead according to James. James chapter 2. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. If we are truly reunited with him by way of his covenant, whether you want to call it new or renewed, the proof will be in us walking according to that covenant as given in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah 31. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. But there is one more element to Numbers chapter 5 that needs to be considered. Numbers chapter 5, verse 31. The husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing, but the woman will bear the consequences of her sin. The woman will bear the consequences of her sin. She will bear the shame of her sin before her people. The shame of her sin will ever be before her. The shame. Yet, he took the shame on the cross for us. Hebrews chapter 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, scorning its shame. But Israel will be saved by Yahweh with an everlasting salvation. You will never be put to shame or disgraced to ages everlasting. He took the shame so we don't have to. 1 Peter chapter 2. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And also, Romans chapter 10, verse 11. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. In Messiah, the shame is removed. Yet, in all this, we see nothing in Numbers 5 that shows a need for the death of the woman. Was there a judgment of death given to the northern kingdom together with the law of the jealous husband? Actually, yes. Consider Ezekiel 16. I will sentence you to the punishment of women who commit adultery and who shed blood. I will bring upon you the blood vengeance of my wrath and jealous anger. But why the punishment of bloodshed? Consider Ezekiel 16, 20. And you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to the idols. Was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols. So not only did he bear the northern kingdom's judgment, of the adulterous wife, but also the judgment for her murder as well. Thus, his death on the cross. It's utterly amazing how all this ties together, all to bring everyone to his covenant that he desires all to be in, as he provided the needed atonement. Consider the same chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, verse 62. So, I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am Yahweh. Then, when I make atonement for you, for all you have done, you will remember and be ashamed, and never again open your mouth, because of your humiliation, declares the sovereign Yahweh. He made atonement. He had to die for the lost sheep, the way he did, to pay the price for her sins. Yet, at the same time, he was releasing himself from the marriage law of Deuteronomy 24, so he could be married to her again, as detailed in the lost sheep teaching. The lost sheep of the northern kingdom, while married to him, became adulterous. Yet, 
after the divorce, she continued in her ways. It was at this time that the Lord himself quotes Deuteronomy 24 to the northern kingdom. Jeremiah chapter 3. If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and marries another man, should he return to her again? The answer is no. Would not the land be completely defiled? The answer is yes. But you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers. Would you now return to me? declares Yahweh. He's basically telling them that even if they wanted to return to him, his own law forbid it. It would defile the land. He continues in showing her all of her ways. The next verse. Look up to the barren heights and see, is there any place where you have not been ravished? By the roadside you sat waiting for lovers, sat like a nomad in the desert. You have defiled the land with your prostitution and wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld, and no spring rains have fallen. Yet you have the brazen look of a prostitute. You refuse to blush with shame. Have you not just called to me, my father, my friend, from my youth? Will you always be angry? Will your wrath continue forever? This is how you talk, but you do all the evil you can. Verse 5 shows how she talks repentance as verse 1 alludes that she wants to return, yet her heart is far from it. Yet, in this same chapter, he calls to her to come back, knowing he had the provision ready by way of his son on the cross to release himself from the marriage law of Deuteronomy 24. Jeremiah 3, verse 12. Go, proclaim this message toward the north. Return, faithless Israel, declares Yahweh. I will frown on you no longer, for I am merciful, declares Yahweh. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against Yahweh, your God. You have scattered your favors to foreign gods under every spreading tree and have not obeyed me, declares Yahweh. Return, faithless people, declares Yahweh, for I am your husband. I will choose you, one from a town and two from a clan, and bring you to Zion. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. Notice how he declares himself her husband again in verse 14, even though this is after the divorce. Jeremiah 3.14 Return, faithless people, declares Yahweh, for I am your husband. I will choose you, one from a town and two from a clan, and bring you to Zion. But again, the divorce has already taken place. How can this be? <laughs> because he speaks to those things that are not as though they were. Compare Romans chapter 4. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Only through Yeshua can one return. Those who are not Messiah, this curse and shame remains. Those who accept his forgiveness and choose to walk after him, the curse of sin is removed because he took the curse for them in taking their place. But if they reject his word, the curse remains. His atonement for them will not cover them as they refuse to accept it and walk in his ways. John chapter 3. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Also in Philippians. For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul again refers to the curse of Numbers 5 here in verse 19. Thus, they remain in their unfaithful prostitute ways, in their love for the world, remaining and even glorying in their shame in a proudful, boastful type manner, making the cause of their swollen stomachs the very God they continue to follow, that of prostitution with the world. 
the very purpose that God divorced his people to begin with. Yet, regarding the marriage law of Deuteronomy 24, that God himself quoted to his people and how it applied to them at that time, though he provided a way of return for them through Yeshua, wouldn't this law be still applicable for his people today as it was back then? If it applied then, and he had to provide a way through his son to be reunited with them, what if this happens after the cross? Meaning this, if one chooses the Lord and then turns away from the truth to follow after another, can he come back? The law of Deuteronomy 24 prohibits him to come back, literally saying it is impossible. So, does it apply today? Is the law of God truly forever? Is there a New Testament verse to validate this for us? Something that compares to that of Deuteronomy 24? Yes, there is. Consider Hebrews chapter 6. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance, because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So it is clear that the marriage law of Deuteronomy 24 stands even today for those who choose to walk away from the faith. But why does the author here in Hebrews refer to the land in verse 7 and 8 after saying this? Because it also ties to Deuteronomy 24. Compare. Then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of Yahweh. Do not bring sin upon the land Yahweh your God is giving you as an inheritance. Yet, chapter 10 confirms it for us again. Chapter 10 of Hebrews. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? Confirmation again that God's law is truly eternal. Yet, here's another. Matthew 5.13 you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Being in the truth and then willfully walking away truly has eternal consequences. This also parallels with that of the unpardonable sin, that being blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. For further details on that, please see our teaching titled, The Unpardonable Sin. Some have alluded that Yeshua, being our high priest, cannot marry one who was divorced or given to prostitution. This is said because of Leviticus 21. Leviticus 21, verse 7. They must not marry women defiled by prostitution or divorced from their husbands because priests are holy to their God. While this is most definitely true, we cannot forget that one who is in Messiah, is a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Galatians chapter 6. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. For, as Romans says, We were buried therefore with him through baptism unto death 
that, like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. In closing, we'd like to give you another thought to ponder. Not only are we referred to as the bride, we are also considered his children. Remember, even in Ezekiel, he said that they slaughtered his children. Ezekiel 16, you slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to idols. Plus, we are all children of Adam. Thus, we are all truly children of God. With this in mind, who performed the first sacrifices? It was God himself in the Garden of Eden, making atonement for the sin of Adam and Eve, and thus clothing them and covering their nakedness. Genesis chapter 3. Yahweh Elohim made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them, thus making him the first high priest. This means that we are all the children of the first high priest. Knowing that we are all referred to in the feminine gender for the bride, I can't help but wonder if we are all considered in the feminine gender in as being children as well. For example, when the northern kingdom committed harlotry, she did so with other gods, just as the other nations were doing, meaning the other gods were the masculine gender for all, thus implying all mankind in the feminine gender. If this is the case, please consider Leviticus chapter 21. If a priest's daughter defiles herself by becoming a prostitute, she disgraces her father. She must be burned in the fire. If we are indeed all, and I mean all humanity, are considered children of the first high priest, and if we are all considered as such in the feminine gender, would we not see something of this parallel in judgment of Leviticus 21 at the end of all things for those daughters of the first high priest who committed harlotry? Yes, we would. And yes, we do. Revelation chapter 20. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. May we never forget that Yeshua took our place on the cross. He nailed the curse of the law to the cross. Don't stay dead in your sins any longer. Colossians 2.13 And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Walk in the freedom of the covenant that he has enabled all to enter in. Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their Elohim, and they will be my people. And Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Walk with him in his eternal covenant today. We hope that you've enjoyed this teaching. Remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. All right, if you would like to discuss anything you've heard so far, hit the number one on your keypad, and uh, that'll let me know that uh, Somebody wants to talk with me. Oh, it looks like somebody did. Uh, area code 607. Who do I have here? Sherry. Who is this? Sherry. Can you hear me? Oh, hey. Yeah, I can hear you. How are you? <laughs> oh, besides being sick, I'm good. Oh, yeah, I've had a little bit of a cough myself, actually. Because it's that time of the year. It is awesome. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I get it every year. I'm I'm actually feeding back through your speakers, I believe. I can hear myself talk. <laughs> no, my 
I'm talking. I got a, I got a earplug, and there's no sound. I don't know why I'm feeding back then. My speakers are off too. I don't know. Um, yeah, sounds fine on this end. Oh, good. The one thing I I was like noticing through the whole thing was just how much it relates to what we are supposed to see in modern day marriage and well, marriage in general. The whole, you know, the promises and, you know, circumcision, very much like when you pass on, well, not pass on, when you exchange uh, wedding rings and stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, a lot of people ask me about the circumcision issues, like, do we still need to be doing that? Or, you know, like, well... You know, I I tell people pray about it. See, see if you if you haven't been, if if you should, um, you know, if you look at Acts 15, it seems like no, nah, it's not something you need to be worried about. Uh, although you go to Acts 16, you see that Paul did uh, circumcise Timothy, but I think it was Timothy. Uh, anyway, uh, he still did anyway, but it seems to be because he was going to be with Jews after that, so rather than having it be an issue, I guess. But um, as far as I could tell, that was made a sign in the, how shall we say, seed dispenser <laughs> of, of Abraham and his descendants thereafter, after Ishmael, um, so that every time the men of Abraham would uh, look down, <laughs> basically they'd remember, hey, I, I've got, I've got to keep myself, you know, doing the right thing. Uh, because ultimately the Messiah had to come through Abraham's line. And oddly enough, of all of the 12 sons of uh, Jacob, the one who dipped his seed dispenser where it didn't belong was Judah, the one through whom the Messiah was going to come. Right. And so, you know, yeah, but that seems to have been, uh, you know, I could be wrong, but that seems to me to be, the, the main issue was, okay, remember, the seed has to be preserved uh, so that Genesis 3.15 can, be, can, can come true. Yeah, and well, I the think, seed, uh, seed of Eve. Go ahead. No, uh, I was not. Oh, uh, I, I didn't think, like, a physical circumcision is, like, a mandate at all. Mm-hmm. It's more of a spiritual separation. Um Oh, uh, I I don't know. That would be, I guess, under the whole baptism of the spirit. Would that be like our what we would, you know, our spiritual circumcision then? Our well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, some people get all wrapped around the axle about baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it, it seems to me that just accepting Christ as your Savior qualifies for a circumcision of the heart. Um, oh, yeah. I went on I went on a quest to understand the difference between, because there's, Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he shows up in the upper room, and he breathes on the disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, but then to those same guys, now earlier he said, the Holy Spirit is with you, soon he will be in you. Well, when he breathed on them, he breathed out, they breathed in, Holy Spirit went in them. Uh, prior to that, the Holy Spirit was with them because Yeshua was with them. But then he tells these same guys to hang around and pray uh, for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And so it's the the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that I believe gives you the circumcision of the heart because that's when he goes right. inside of you. Right. Um, whereas the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as I understand it, it's just, just like water baptism. You go into the water. You know, yeah. the water doesn't the, the water doesn't go in you. If it does, you you end up uh, you know drowning. <laughs> so, uh, I would say circumcision is the indwelling, whereas being baptized in the Holy Spirit is you going into the Holy Spirit in a sense. Um, we see the people who are baptized in the Holy Spirit go where the Holy Spirit goes. You know, Yeshua was compelled to go where the Spirit led him. Paul was withheld from going to places and was led in other places where the Holy Spirit led him. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there was another thing that, you know, was mentioned in the 119 uh, um, video that you you were playing was uh, that we were all children of God. Now, 
don't get me wrong, I believe we are all creation of God, but mm-hmm. I don't think we're all children of God for the simple fact of what First John chapter 3 speaks of, talks mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. And children of the devil. So right. I, I think the acceptance of Christ is where self begins. And it is how do I want to say it? It's where we become set apart as children of God. Mm-hmm. Until that point, I mean, and, and until you accept Christ, there, there's still a separation. I mean... Yeah, yeah. To, to those who accept Christ, the same, he gave power to become sons of God. So, right. you know, you, you've, you've got to accept him. I mean, yeah, I, I, I could agree with that. There's a different, there's a, a differentiation between creations of God and children of God. The, right. the children of God are those who are doing what God wants them to, you know, to do. I mean, like Jesus did, he, even when the people were outside and say, Hey, your, your mom and your brothers and sisters are here, you know? And he's like, well, who are they? <laughs> my, my brothers and sisters and my mother are those who do my will, you know, do my father's will. Uh, so. There's this thing between male and female, you know, that, as far as uh, the God's family, it's those who are obeying his word and doing their best to try to be imitators of his law. I, you know, that's like the one thing. Like, I've, I I love family. I love them dearly. And uh, we, we have had many conversations over following the commandments. And, you know, I told him, you know, no, I do not think it's a salvation thing. It's an act of love. The yeah. same way you would show your husband or wife that you love them by taking those people that you exchanged and living according to them, you know, not cheating, you know, putting them away when they're sick or <laughs> poor and things like that. Yeah. So uh, I I did have one question. I know it's kind of like doesn't really um, apply to this week's Taurus, but as far as the the six hundred and thirteen mm-hmm. laws. Now, yeah. obviously, we're not all Levites, not mm-hmm. priests, so that's a lot of laws that. So under that category, apply. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. That's what Everybody I've been telling people. Because people, when you start saying the law of God, they get they they try to trip you up. They're like, oh, yeah, you're, you're doing all 613. Well, first of all, first thing I would say is uh, these Christians are hypocrites to do that in the first place because they're the same ones that would advocate that we must obey the laws of the land. Well, there's a whole lot more than 613 laws in the land that they're all saying we all have to obey. Um, but when it comes to the 613 so-called laws in the Torah, uh, you've got to bear in mind, first of all, that was some rabbi that decided to sit down and count every time God said do something and don't do something. So, okay, sure, God said do this, don't do that, perhaps 613 times in the Torah. But like you said, I mean, there's a ton of them that are only applicable to Levites. The whole bunch are only applicable if there's a temple. Uh, there's a lot that are only applicable to Nazarites, those who take a Nazarite vow voluntarily, uh, to slaves, uh, to women, to farmers. So, you know, there was no way in the history of the world that anybody could have ever kept all 613 commandments because there's no female priests. So even the Levites couldn't keep the ones that were applicable to women. You know, they weren't slaves, so they couldn't keep the ones applicable to slaves. Because they're Levites, they weren't Nazarites, because a Nazarite is somebody who's not of the tribe of Levi who wants to do what a Levite does. <laughs> so, you know, and Nazarites couldn't do what the Levites did. So, I mean, no one could ever have ever, ever have done the 613. So I just dismissed that whole argument right there. I mean, it's like, but then it boils down to, look. Why are you people trying to nitpick? Here's the bottom line. Should we or should we not obey God? If you say yes, then we're in agreement. If you say no, well, I'm going to wonder if you're even saved to begin with. 
right? <laughs> I would say whenever I think of laws of God, uh, Ten Commandments is the only thing that, like, you know, right there they are. They were written by God himself, you know? And That's right. The other ones, you know, some of them were just, Good practice, like, you know, when it comes down to food and things like that, everybody wants to right. live longer, live healthier. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, uh, the, the laws concerning modesty, uh, I mean, uh, most, and uh, I'm a lover of people, and most people I have talked to men, in general, the majority of them, yeah, I mean, your half are interesting to Look at, but they don't marry them. They mm-hmm. marry the more modest, quiet, you know, the the, the kinder women, <laughs> not the Miley Cyrus's uh, world. <laughs> Miley Cyrus, you know, it's funny to say that because somebody just posted. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but somebody had edited together one of the old Star Trek episodes where Captain Kirk and the crew. They uh, they stumble across the broadcast of the Miley Cyrus thing. And uh, so they got it up on the big screen on, on, on the bridge of the Enterprise and just everybody's reaction to it. Oh, man. I just saw that, like, right before we went on the air tonight. It was hilarious. But I'm sorry. I'm just rabbit trailing. Uh, but, it, I mean, it's true. I mean, every guy I've ever talked to, they, you know, they, they want a woman, not somebody that's, you know. Trashy. Yeah, they don't want a trashy. Right, and if you're immodest and things like that, I, I mean, you bring attention to yourself, and you you cause stumbling stumbling blocks to be put before other people that causes lust in these things. So, I mean, as a female, I don't want to cause someone else to sin. Right. It, it speaks volumes about the person, the individual character. Yeah, and it, it's like Rob. Yeah. Uh, it speaks volumes about a person's character and how right. they dress themselves. I mean, if a walk like a duck and talk, you know, duck and talk, I mean, uh-huh. if a walk like a duck, more than most likely, it's probably a duck. Well, yeah, it makes you wonder if they're doing that when they're single, what are they going to do when they're married? Right. And, you know, and I, I deal a lot with uh, young females. And, you know, a lot of they want to cry on my shoulder when they're single and, you know, why, you know, wonder why God hasn't sent a man to them. I'm like, well, how about you take an inventory of yourself? What are you doing? A godly man, man, start being a godly woman. Keep yourself in check and, you know, let God deal with the rest of it. That's right. Uh, yeah, that was like, you know, I, I mean, like I have mentioned before, I grew up Pentecostal, and there's a lot of do's and don'ts as far as dress code within, the, you know, that religion. It, I mean, I can't really truly fault them. Because I, you know, I, I fault the legalistic aspect of it, but I don't fault the modesty aspect, you know, I mean, most guys I know, they prefer a woman who dresses like a woman <laughs> and acts mm-hmm. like a woman. <laughs> but they use they use one particular verse in Deuteronomy, and I've read that verse a thousand times, and every single time I don't see it as a woman wearing pants of a cross-dress situation. And yeah, that, we we actually talked about that at, at some length. That was uh, when we were doing the book of Deuteronomy. I mean, the point is that women shouldn't be trying to be like men, and men shouldn't be trying to be like women. Right. Because, right. Because, because, you know, it, one of the problems with uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement is they very quickly become pharisaical um, yeah. and yeah. start doing the same thing the Pharisees did in complicating the issue um and adding stuff that doesn't need to be added there, you know. Um and becoming very rabbinic. And when our group was starting to slide in that direction, um uh, we you know, you start coming up with all kinds of stupid stuff that, you know, or you're not supposed to start a fire. Well, I mean, when I turn on the light switch it starts a fire, or if I turn the ignition of my car it starts a fire. I mean, 
so you know, maybe we're not supposed to have our lights on. Maybe we're not supposed to drive to our Bible study. And, you know, all these thoughts start coming in your head to, to really get down to what, what's going on with that. I mean, starting a fire back in biblical times meant going outside, cutting wood, uh, you know, hauling it to your house and rubbing sticks together and doing, you know, labor to make a fire. And it's not like turning an ignition key or, you know, turning a light switch. But, you know, you have to think through these things, and that's why I got excited about uh, Dr. Russ Houck's book, uh, Epidemic, because his book examined the ex- infected roots of Judaism and Christianity, pagan Christianity and rabbinic Judaism, so you don't go down that route. But when we got to that part about the, the dress issue, um, you know, some some things came up, and people were talking about I'm like, look, guys, you know, let's just get down to what the point is. It's it's transvestites. I mean, it's talking about women acting like they think they're men and men acting like they think they're women. You know, it's not, hey, my wife's cold. I'm going to put my man's sport coat on her, and it's, that's going to be sin? No. You know, but people people go that way. I mean, because it's the same thing. If they're going to get all psychotic about, you know, well, women can't wear pants, well, then, then chivalry's dead. <laughs> you can't, if your wife's cold too bad, you can't take your man's jacket off and put it on her. You know, it, right. it, that's that's absurd. You know, that's where you start going crazy with the stuff. I mean, you got to keep it in proper perspective. The laws that God created are not burdensome. They, they're there for our benefit, right. you know, uh, all of them. You know, well, I can't eat pork. Well, you can. You can eat whatever you want. But, you know, God tells you, hey, don't eat the garbage collectors because you are what you eat. So, you know, if you want to stay healthy, well, don't. <laughs> you know? it is, you look into all the... the the things that can actually that you're going to die every time you eat a piece of bacon, but what is that possibility? Yeah, well, I mean, you're not going to die if you eat it, but you you may be shortening your lifespan. You know, well, it's, you, you know, it's, good, it's going to have physical problems. You know, you know, you'll have if you, you know, if I you eat one eat piece of bacon. You know, I can't. I, I not anymore. I can't. But I've eaten plenty. Of, I love bacon. I, man, bacon. I like it. But, uh, you know, I've eaten plenty of bacon and pork and ham and all that stuff. I used to like it, you know. But now that I know not only biblically but scientifically how bad it is for me, I, you know, I don't do it. I don't I don't crave it, you know, and it's not something that's even on my radar anymore. But yeah, that, that's, I mean, a, that's a choice that, you know, look, that's not one of the Ten Commandments. Um, but it is one of the so-called 613 that are in there, and bearing in mind that all of them are for our own benefit, I said, well, why wouldn't I want to do something that's for my own benefit anyway, it, plus obeying God on top of it, you know, why not? And, and you know, and the, the thing is, like, you know, like I was talking to my grandma is that, you know, not, you know, whether I eat bacon or I don't eat bacon, I don't eat it. Of salt is, but um, it's not a salvation issue. And mm-hmm. I, you know, I've tried to explain this to her, and she goes, "Well, not following the Ten Commandments is not a salvation issue. Then what's the problem?" I said, like, "How we show we love God, though, you know, all throughout the New Testament and Old Testament, uh, if you love me, you will keep my commandments." Mm-hmm. That's simple. <laughs> Yeah, very cut and dry, and now there it's not a salvation issue. Yeah, matter of the heart. It's a love issue. Well, down to whether or not you're following wedding vows or not. Yeah, it like like Rob said, it's following your wedding vows. Right. Well, I don't know if you heard what uh, I talked about in the last broadcast I did on Wednesday night when. And I posted Chad, uh, Chad who joins us here, Chad Schaefer, uh, Warrior Shepherd is usually his chat room name. He uh, gave a testimony that was just outstanding. But in part of his testimony, probably the last 45 minutes or so, he talked about the covenant that was given at Mount Sinai and how it, when God revealed to him, you know, when the Holy Spirit's living inside of you, God is inside of you, uh, those aren't do's and don'ts list. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's a list. It's a promise list. In other words, it's, it's it, when I married my wife, we exchanged vows. I promised her stuff. She promised me stuff. I didn't give her a list and say, okay, here's the things you got to do. And here's a few in there you can't do if you want to be married to me. 
that, that's not what I did. And that's not what God did either. If you change the way you view it, uh, it's kind of like the old illusion, you know, is it the old woman or the, the young woman picture? You know, it depends on how you look at it. Well, Chad said, if God's inside of you, if, you know, in marriage, a man comes together with a woman and the two become one. Well, we're in a marriage relationship with God. When we come into covenant with him and we become one together, uh, you know, then he's saying you're not going to kill people. You're you're not going to go stealing. You're not going to commit adultery. It, yeah. It's a promise. Yeah. He, he says you you get in covenant with me and you won't do these things. I mean I'm I'm not like man I'm like my the gerbil jumped off the wheel of my head. You know I just went freewheeling there for a little while. I'm like whoa, dude, that's amazing. And now that's all I see when I look at it. I'm like, of course. That's why I think John says what he says in First John, you know, where he says, if, if anyone says he knows him, you know, think about that in a biblical term, uh, know him, uh, but does not keep his commandments. He's a liar. The truth's not in him. Because if the truth was in you, you'd be doing those things. That's the promise. I'm like, man, that makes so much sense. Let's see, yeah, I mean, that, that's like, you know, I have, she says she struggles a little bit with this. And I told her, I was like, well, I believe in keeping this. Uh, she looked forward to Friday nights. And, and, you know, and, you know, I don't see a problem with going to church on Sunday, but. Right, you know, I don't either. Saturday. You know, and she's like, yeah, well, I, do you, did you ask me if I did my dishes on Saturdays? I was like, I don't consider that work. Is that something you do after dinner? <laughs> it's just like washing your hands before dinner, you know, or, or after dinner, you know, taking a shower if you get mud on you and things like that. I was like, but and it all boils down to these are not issue. These are a because you love him issue. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, I, and you know, hard for people that have grew up sitting in church on Sunday to 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 make that change right away. I mean, it a transitional period. It's like, you, even for me, you know, it's where it all began with me was, I was, I, I knew God loved me. I knew I was loved by him, but I didn't really understand as far as how I could show my love back. And then I mean, really show it. And, you know, in prayer, the, the thing that came to me was, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I, you know, it's one of those no, immediately he's referring to the Ten Commandments. So, I mean, I don't see how people can't see that. But yeah, I mean, what it, what it boils down to for me is like, okay, that would, that would, first of all, just imagine marble and a finger writing in it like butter. <laughs> okay? God took right. stone and wrote in it with his own finger. I mean, not not to cast anything, you know, down on the inspired scriptures that were written by men, because I believe God wrote through men to do that. But, right. but that, to me, there's a little bit of a difference between, you know, a quill writing on parchment and the finger of God carving through stone like butter <laughs> and giving us ten promises that we'll do if we'll marry him. I'm like, right. well, you know, what, what one of us would get married to our spouse, you know, and exchange vows and then say, no, nah, I don't really want to do that anymore. You know, I, I don't think I want to honor the vows. Uh, marriage ain't going to last long. No, that, it's not going to last long. Exactly. And, you know, that's why God got so upset. And, you know, and that's why I love that teaching uh, that we listened to by 119. If you get a right. chance, you just watch, watch the video. It's one of those you got to watch a couple of times because – Man, it, it really, it really hit me. I mean, I, I was, uh, I watched it. I think it was the day after my uh, foot surgery, and I couldn't do anything. I was like literally bedridden and couldn't couldn't get up. And uh, so I laid there in bed and I, I watched that. that. Instead of going to the house church we usually go to, it was one Sabbath day, 
I just laid there in bed and watched that. And man, I just I wept like a baby because I have I've written, directed, and played Jesus in passion plays several times. And uh, you know, I'm one of those writer, director, actor types that will really dive into the subject matter and as deep as I can go. And, uh, you know, of course, I've read the scriptures many times, but really studied, I mean, from a medical perspective, I really studied the crucifixion and what it does to you. And, um, man, when he talked about the the bitter waters and what it does, and, and, you know, when you read that in the Torah, it talks about if she's guilty, her thigh will waste away and her stomach will swell. And it's like, wow, that's exactly what happened to him. And when he was in the garden, I've always just taken it as, you know, metaphorical or whatever. He says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What cup? I mean, nothing Jesus said was spoken in a void. Everything that he said and everything he did has precedence in the Torah. And so, I mean, there he is in the garden. He knows full well that he's about to take the curse that the unfaithful, adulterous bride deserved onto himself. I mean, really, when you get down to it, we are the ones that would be supposed to have to take the bitter water drink. But That's he took true. it on, on our behalf. I mean, like, wow. I'm, it's just, I am constantly amazed as the various layers of the onion keep getting peeled away, and I see more and more revelation every single time. This is the fourth time doing this. Every time something new, something deeper. It's like, man, just, that's why I wanted to kind of focus tonight on the New Testament side of things. I mean, I've got notes and everything from, from last year up there. And of course, if you get the book or to watch the DVD on the Archon Invasion, it really goes into the Genesis 14 deal. So to, to get in these scriptures and the New Testament side, and that's, I think where I might steer this year's study anyway, um, there's still more to talk about, obviously, in the Torah, but I want to really bring it all together with the with the New Testament. Doug Hamp says the New Testament is just a commentary on the Old Testament. And, uh, so, you know, that, that makes sense. Yeah, it is, because nothing is written in a void. All of it goes back to stuff that's got precedence in the Torah and the Prophets and the Psalms. Well, that's like, you know, that's one of the things that I was also bringing up. Uh, I talk to my grandma a lot. She is a, a huge and of my life, because, like, one of the things I was telling her is, uh, yeah, she keeps me grounded, but that was one of the things I was telling her is, you know, a lot of things that I was taught and stuff just seemed so contradictory to what I was reading in the scriptures, and since she was like, you know, she constantly tells me, God doesn't change, God doesn't change, and I'm like, so why does it seem like he changes? Right, you know, if so God doesn't have, change, why didn't he all of a sudden say, according to most Christians, uh, everything I wrote in the first two-thirds of the Bible, I'm just throwing out now. <laughs> it, it, that's like what I was thinking. I was like, I had to go back and really rethink these things. You know, God doesn't change. We change. The way we perceive things. And, uh, and, and like when I... Stumbled, stumbled across, uh, it was actually Doug Hamp first through the whole, you know, Nephilim studies. And then through him, I found you. And it was just, no lies, see, where prayer is being answered. Because I couldn't understand why the God of the Old Testament was so wrathful and why he would destroy mm-hmm. women and children and everything. You know, it's even deeper than that. Um, and then when I realized that yes, that was involved and exactly how deep that wickedness went, that it, you know, it was revolved around these fallen angels, it was just like, get it. Okay, now I understand it. Oh, God, this wrathful God we were seeing wasn't, because he didn't love people, it was because of what was going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. true. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it's it's been like really clean nights and reading the scripture on my own and looking at it from a different perspective. And I don't really take my heart when it says, you know, the you know, this was 
to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles? Well, mm-hmm. scriptures were written with a, a a Hebrew mindset. It's probably good right. to think about it from that mindset as well. Right. Uh, I mean, that's what I've like, been trying to say. Even, even in the even if the, if, even if you want to argue that the New Testament was written in Greek, okay, let's say the whole New Testament was written in Greek. Fine, it was written in Greek by Hebrews. Right. <laughs> so you, you know, even if it was even if it was written in Greek, it's still written with a Hebrew mindset, and with the Hebrew mindset comes first of all, you know, a, a devout Hebrew will have been very well acquainted with the Torah to begin with. Uh, and they just have a different thought process anyway. I mean, it's the Eastern versus Western mindset. Right. I mean, uh, and like, uh, I never realized that there was so many different versions of the Bible. Uh, I mean, I grew up reading King James. And, uh, extremely inspirational, no matter what version of the Bible you get. I mean, you can still find planification and belief on, you know, Christ on the cross, you could still, uh, I mean, get a lot from King James. But when you really get into the the, the other versions, going back to the, you know, the, there's just like certain things just read different. There's the, they're more in depth. Like I think you, it was you had brought up the um, the conversation with who was it Peter at the about the difference between you know agape love and yeah right uh, first John or no uh, the Gospel of John the last chapter of John yeah yeah I mean unless you unless you look at the Greek you, you're totally missing the entire point of that conversation. Yeah, so the, you know that just that right there is just an inspiration to deeper to you know try to see. Well, a, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing is I'm telling people because you know some of my critics out there are like you don't know how to speak Greek, you don't know anything. And I'm like, well, you're right, I don't, I don't know Greek, nor do I know Hebrew, but I have the ability to look at a concordance and see where words are and where they are not, and I can see where words have been twisted and distorted it. and. And changed, and you know, are added or subtracted or whatever the case may be. Like, it doesn't take uh, a, a, a grammar specialist in Greek to look at that passage in John and see agape versus phileo. Yeah. You know, and and know that the English word love is, is failing miserably to convey what's really being spoken there. I don't need to be that's, a Greek scholar to see that. Well, that's the difference between me loving my brother and me loving my husband. I mean, agape love is a more intimate, deep love. That's something, True. you know, you know a, 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 a become one flesh type of love. So, yeah. Unconditional. Uh, yeah, and it, it's, I mean, there's a lot of nice for uh, because, you know, the devil likes to remind you of your past. I will cry before God because, oh, man, I've done a lot of bad things. And, you know, he just reminds me constantly, but I love you. Mm-hmm. I don't just love you. <laughs> it's just like, you know, because I, he could have left me out there. I could have what, continued down that very, very destructive path. And it's a self-destruction. And just, yeah, it's just the way things played out. I, I have so much to thank him for. And I, just saying thank you just will never be enough. So I that's why I really wanted to show God that I loved him. The only way to do that is to to live a life and do my best to find favor in his eyes. I don't care less what my neighbor thinks of me, but I do care deeply about what God thinks of me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, wow. Well, uh, anything else? Anything Anything jump out at you other than uh, the latter part of it um, in Genesis or in Isaiah? Uh, oh, yeah, the name changing. I thought that hmm. was quite significant where, when uh, God was separating 
his people from the Gentiles, you know, pagan worship and everything, that he changed their name. And how in Revelation chapter 3 it talks about us getting a new name. Well, I don't know if it's all of us, but I know there's a certain amount. I forget what it is. Hold on. It's uh, I know it's in Revelation 3. Back page, back page. Looking up a lot of different things. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, Revelation 3.12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no, go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of the heavens from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Mm-hmm. And I just yeah. thought that was significant that would... It, you know, he was separating out his inheritance. He gave, you know, basically the mother and father of that new inheritance a new name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you know what was, I like about the, the name change, too, is um, I'm going to grab my little handy-dandy book here. Uh, if you haven't got it, you need to get it. The uh, Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names by J.B. Jackson. It's, it's like the coolest $5 you'll ever spend. Uh, you can just go look up all the names in the Bible and what they mean and stuff. But like Abram, A-B-R-A-M, that means father is exalted. You know, yeah. he's like a, kind of like a prince almost, an exalted father. Um, but Abraham is father of a of many nations, father of a great multitude. And, you know, those were, those were words. I mean, the Hebrew words, they, they meant things, you know, and I actually ended up uh, looking up my name a while back just to see what my, because well, mine has, you know, Robert goes back as a Gaelic origin, if I remember right, uh, is, is uh, bright fame and Skiba is Polish, but it, it, and I believe it was actually a shortened form of a longer Scandinavian name, but the the name Skiba actually is a farming term that goes back to uh, plowing a furrow for planting seed. And I didn't find that out until probably two years after God gave me this whole idea for seed, <laughs> seed the series. I mean, that's like what I'm doing right now. And I, when I, so here I am creating this TV series called Seed, and God gave me the name before anything. He's like, you're, you're going to make a TV series that's going to be called Seed. And I had a, a vague idea what it was going to be about. But the more he started downloading to me, the more I was like, whoa, okay, that's like the perfect name for that. And I kept working on working on working on I said, I wonder what my name means. Oh, wow. So right. I'm, actually, I'm actually living my name right now. Um, but it's what, that's what happened with Abram. Abram was, you know, exalted father, but he didn't have any kids. You know, uh, so God changes his name so that every time he walked up to somebody and introduced himself, he said, hi, I'm father of many nations. You know, that's what people people would have heard in that language, you know, and uh, and manifested, you know, calling the things that are not as though they be. That's what he did. He, you know, for a good while before he ever produced a son, he was saying, hey, I'm father of many nations. Well, yeah, as even in Revelation uh, chapter two, it talks about the white stone with a new name. Yeah, uh, on it. yeah, I'm interested in that. I really want to know more about that. Um, uh, well, Doug and I talked about it briefly, I think, in the last Quest for Truth episode, but uh, I still want to get in. I don't know if there is an answer that we'll ever know before you know this side of eternity, but that's definitely cool. Yeah. But oh, that's like, you know, what I started thinking about, you know, wow, it's, it's, you know, why would he change their name, you know? What would be the purpose? And then when you really think about it, he was separating his people, and that's where it began. So uh, then I started, like, you know, I started doing the whole, you know, Bible gateway, you know, word search for looking for, well, other places talked about a new name. And, you know, and I thought it was, you know, pretty cool that it's also mentioned in Revelations. Mm-hmm. So, huh. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll take a name change from God any day of the week. Because <laughs> <laughs> like anything else, you know, it's going to be a good one. 
Uh, One thing I, I uh, wanted to mention, we watched uh, the movie the other night, uh, what is it? Pacific, uh, Pacific Rim. Rim. Oh, yeah. And uh, you got the, the two scientists that are, like, the one he's freaking out, and they're going back and forth about you know, science, and the other dude, he's going back and, you know, they're going back and forth, numbers, no, science, numbers, science, numbers, science. And finally, he and kind of sort of ended the argument by saying that the language of God is in the numbers. The, if anything is ever to the words of God, it is in the numbers. And and I just I had to stop and I looked over at Sherry and I said, it's kind of funny because when you stop and think of Hebraic, mm-hmm. they're interlaced. Yeah, right. Yeah, they are. It is a just. I, I, I was saying, I mean, it was just I was left a little dumbstruck about the fact that they would like sneak that in. There's a lot of subtle snuck in there, though. Yeah, that, that's yeah. A, one thing. We took a lot of a uh, lot of movies, and uh, we talk about how how ironic they would. A lot of the movies they talk things they show you in the movies twenty, three, fifty years road, you see them in the movie. like flip tones. Um, cell phone, mm-hmm. cell phone, cell phone, mm-hmm. with first yep, Captain Kirk. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's I, true. I, I try to deny it based on the fantasy reality of it. Is Hollywood is notorious for leaking uh-huh. secrets or spelling things out, whether it is biblical or governmental. Oh yeah. They've done it for centuries since before the big screen, honestly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, hey, guys, I got like two minutes to wrap up here, uh, so I'm going to have to cut this short. But thank you so much for calling in. Thank you for doing what you do. All right. Well, uh, Shabbat Shalom, everybody, and uh, blessings to you. And um, everybody else, thank you guys so much for listening. Have a great night and a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you back next time. Good night, everybody. Thanks.